I am now going to call this gathering to order and say that it is a real pleasure to welcome all of you here to the Chicano Studies Research Center. My name is Marissa Lopez. I'm an associate professor of English and Chicano Studies here at UCLA. I, thank you. <laughs> I am also uh, this fall the interim director of the CSRC while Sean takes a well-deserved sabbatical. And I want uh, to start by welcoming especially our new and returning visiting scholars, Leticia Alvarado, Ernesto Chavez, who I see, uh, Cecilia Fajardo Hill, Lucy Perez Huber, Carlos Haro, Juan Carlos Herrera, and Miriam Melton Villanueva. We look forward to conversations with you all throughout the quarter, and we are very proud to be supporting your work. This has been a very busy year at the CSRC. I'll just give you some of the highlights. We published the 10th book in our Aver Artist series, this one on Luis Cruz As uh, Asaceta. We can, um, Purchase that outside in the hallway. Two other books in that series on uh, Ricardo Valverde and Pepon Osorio, also for sale outside, uh, collectively won five other awards from the International Latino Book Awards competition. Ricardo Valverde was the focus of a collaborative exhibit that we put on with the Vincent Price Art Museum at ELAC at uh, East Los Angeles Community College, and that exhibition was curated by CSRC visiting scholar uh, Cecilia Fajardo Hill, and that grounds our developing relationship with ELAC. We'll be there, in fact, this weekend for the Latino Book and Family Festival, so we hope to see some of you there. Also, in November, we'll be hosting a range of talks at the center to which you are all warmly welcome, so please check out our flyers and our events while you're here. And keep an eye out for us, very forward looking in November, in 2017, uh, as part of Pacific Standard Time 2. We just will be, as was Pacific Standard Time 1, Pacific Standard Time 2, a series of exhibitions throughout the city sponsored by the Getty Center. Uh, we've already begun working with the Autry Museum on these projects, and we will update you via email, newsletter, and uh, Twitter. <laughs> I like to call Twitter. Yeah. We're now on Twitter, so follow us. Uh, another exciting development for us in 2014. We're on Twitter, follow us, please. Uh, so 2014 also saw the CSRC investing in its oral history projects, bringing together three separate initiatives, El Chicano, Aver, and the LGBT Mujeres, uh, in order to foreground and make accessible the dynamic work that we've been doing in these areas. I'm very pleased to have with us here this afternoon, Karen Mary Davalos, who is, where did she go, where did she go? Oh, there you are. <laughs> you should have blended in with your gray in the chairs. There she is, uh, the fabulous Karen Mary, whose interviews for the LH Channel Project are the foundation of our oral history collection. Karen has published two books with the CSRC Press, one on the Mexican Museum of San Francisco papers as part of our Chicano Archive series, and the other on artist Yolanda Lopez as part of the Aver series. In 2015, Karen will publish a third book with us, which is making me very jealous. Third book. I'm just trying to get a second one out the door, but uh, Karen Mary's third book will be a history of contemporary Chicano art that promises to remix our received notions of what Chicano art is, was, and will be. So thank you, Karen, for being with us uh, today. And thank you also to Virginia Espino, is an oral historian from UCLA's Center for Oral History Research, and we'll hear from uh, Virginia in a bit. But before I introduce Virginia, I need to thank a few people. First and foremost, thanks are due to the wonderful, wonderful staff, student workers, and volunteers without whom none of the wonder wonderful work we do would be possible. So please, a round of applause. <laughs> thanks to all of you, Mike, Connie, Rebecca, um, just because I'm seeing your faces and all the names that I didn't mention. Uh, so all of the work that we do we not, would not be possible without the staff, but this party that we're going to have uh, would not be possible without the sponsorship of the Institute for American Cultures and the Office of Faculty Diversity. So a little bit of applause for We really appreciate their support. And the party, the party wouldn't be possible without support, but the party would be no so thank you, Dan, for being here with us this afternoon. And now, it is my very, very great pleasure to introduce to you Virginia Espino, oral historian, filmmaker, and archival adventurer. 
Virginia co-produced the film No Mas Bebes Por Vida, which investigates the history of Mexicanas who were uh, coercively sterilized at County USC Medical Center here in Los Angeles during the 60s and 70s. Many of these women spoke no English uh, and have testified that they were prodded into tubal litigation during the complete stages of active labor or while they were awaiting emergency cesarean sections. So it's an amazing movie. I hope that you all had the chance to see it. It came out as part of PBS's Point of View series. Um, but Virginia is going to speak to us today about our oral history projects. And we were very, very fortunate to have her here with us. So please join me in welcoming Virginia. Thank you very welcome. Well, it's so great to be here. Um, this is the first time I'm at the podium, but I definitely helped be behind the scenes with Lisa putting on some fantastic events here. And it's wonderful to see everybody and to uh, celebrate the CSRC. So um, I want to thank Cho Noriega for inviting me to, to discuss your oral history collection. I've been going through it. It's fascinating. Um, for our communities, oral history has transformed historical narratives about gender, politics, labor, and sexuality, documenting the stories of those often left from mainstream narratives. These oral histories breathe new life into our understanding of how Chicanas and Chicanos have transformed and shaped the United States. So I was looking at Dan Guerrero's interview, um, and it was conducted by Los Angeles Staff Times um, journalist, um, Carolina Miranda. And as um, Professor, um, <laughs> <Why am I better>? <laughs> <laughs> Lopez Lopez. stated it's part of the LGBT Mujeres Initiative which is a really incredible initiative to start documenting these really important <coughs> stories that have, have not really been examined at this level. People have, have always shared stories. Oral history is an old tradition. It's an, an important tradition. But to get it into the universities, to get students reading it, it's a really important um, aspect of that work. And that's what I do at UCLA. It's part of my job in the libraries to, to collect these stories. So this, this um, oral history offers a window into a world altered by time and space. And it shows us through his own words. So oral history is really about eyewitness accounts. It's about personal testimony, memory, and, and one's understanding of events. And it's, it's very much a coming of age story. And I'd like to read you a quote that Mr. Guerrero, when he's talking about growing up in East Los Angeles. So our neighborhood was just a neighborhood. There were frame houses. And over the years, my parents stuccoed the house. And then they put in a new driveway. And then they eventually built apartments in the back. Our property was quite large. So I could have my, uh, no, excuse me. So, so they could rent them and have extra income. And you know, put in bay windows. Mm -hmm. But it was a continual. When I got to be about 15, they added a bedroom so I could have my own room. So they just kept fixing it up, fixing up that place. But they would not leave East LA. My parents used to say, no, the minute anybody does well, they leave. And we want to stay here. I wasn't crazy about that, but we did. So in that little paragraph, you get different themes about community commitment, love of family, and you also get a sense of, of a middle class family because quite often, when people tell stories about Mexicans, Mexican Americans, Chicanos, Chicanas, it's about working class, poverty, which is part of our experience. But we also have this other experience, which is the middle class experience, and I think your family represents that, being a homeowner. And it also shows how astute, how, what astute business people your, your parents were in, in building apartments and renting them and making a, a financial security for, for your family. So the other significant collection in this oral history series documents Chicana and Chicana, the Chicana and Chicana art scene and the artists that created it. And Professor um, Davalos, who Marissa told you about, is, um, does important work there. Um, she does a wonderful job of bringing out the joys and the pain of challenging the mainstream art world with the formation of avant-garde artist, artist collectives such as the East Los Angeles Streetscapers, Self-Help Graphics, the Royal Chicano Air Force, and many, many more other organizations. Um, combined, these oral histories tell the story and offer a window of the creative force of the power behind these individuals. It, it, generally speaking, oral histories document 
a person's upbringing, their childhood, their relationship with their family. And so you get a window into what actually shaped that person to the point where they kind of exploded onto whether it's an art scene or a political scene or even in the labor movement. So that's what makes these life histories really important as you go through the stories of one's life. So you can see how this creative force reshaped the Los Angeles art scene forever. Changed the way we looked at walls and the way that we look at canvas. So I hope that you have a chance to, to visit the, the oral histories on the CSRC website and read some of these stories that offer insights into many different elements and um, experiences. Thank you. Let me tell you, I've been oral history scary because you know it's there like forever. <laughs> so, uh, but I was glad to do it. I was glad to do it. I've been wanting to it for a long time, and I, I, I keep yelling at Sean. You know, I'm not getting any younger. I said, and, and you know, between well, you'll you'll find out a little bit about my uh, background. There were just too many important stories, not of me, but of people I knew and that I experienced, and uh, I didn't want to croak and take them with me. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for coming here today. Um, you know, as a gentleman of a certain age, and not to frighten all the youngins, but it happens pretty quickly, as some of you have found out, and uh, you look back on your life and find that it has been very much lived in chapters, like a good book. A good book, not the good book. Mine has been a great read so far. A real page turner. Not without its bumps and challenges and moments of deep and dark and bitter despair, but a great read overall. And I thought I'd share a few chapters with you uh, this afternoon. I'm still writing it, by the way. Still looking forward to that next chapter, the next page, hoping not to get to the epilogue anytime soon. I've had many incarnations within my life journey, but always in the arts. You could say it's in my DNA. My dad had a long and celebrated career in music. A singer, composer, considered the father of Chicano music. I point out that he was my father first. <laughs> Lalo Guerrero was all about his music. That was his art, his voice and guitar, his tools. He composed and recorded in every genre of Latino music, boleros, chachas, mambos, tropical, norteño, corridos, ballads about our Mexican-American Chicano experience, our heroes. Dad used to say, well, I only wrote about what I saw. But in doing only that, hey, Armando. In doing only that, <laughs> he became the musical historian of his beloved Chicano culture. He used his music, his art, to entertain, but also to inspire, and often to make a social statement. We always had a great relationship, very close when I was a kid. By my teens, we had little in common. He was singing rancheras. I was lip syncing to songs from Broadway musicals. He liked sports. I liked Judy Garland. Eventually, it came full circle, and we finally had our time together. Great times. We worked together, played together, laughed together a lot. He enjoyed a long life, and I'm very grateful we shared the last chapters of his journey in such a very special way. DNA, probably, but I also had a friend. We met in grade school. He was a year behind me, and we were instant BFFs. He became part of our family as our friendship grew through the years until his life was cut short by AIDS in 1989. He was just 48 years old. Carlos Amaras was all about the visual arts. Brushes, pastel chalks, drawing paper, and canvas, his tools. He became a well-known and highly respected artist, an important figure in Chicano art history, using his art to create beauty, to inspire, and often to make a social statement before he was stolen away too early. So many chapters left unwritten. I still wonder about all that would have been. I tell you about Dad and Carlos because they both had a profound influence, not only on our culture, but in my life. Most importantly, perhaps, my awakening 
My life chapter on activism was eventually written largely because of them. That chapter arrives late in my life book, a cause for some guilt, embarrassment, took a long while. I wasn't ready. I believe we each get to things when we get to things, and that is when we're ready. Activism. The use of direct, often confrontational actions such as a demonstration or strike in opposition to or in support of a cause. Google. Art can be confrontational. It can be in opposition to or in support of a cause, certainly direct, a mural, a song, a play, a book, a poem, a film, a dance piece. My road to a much belated activism, the performing arts, as a producer. My cause of many years, the Latino experience, more specifically the Mexican-American Chicano. Latino-themed television, music specials, live concert events that celebrate our <coughs> culture, tell our stories, make a statement. More recently, my activism has, has expanded to include the LGBTQ experience as a writer and performer, more specifically, the gay Latino. I wrote a solo show about it, Gay Tino. We'll get to that later. I grew up in East LA, where Carlos and I were early dreamers and adventurers. We couldn't wait to grow up and just get our life started for real, you know, away from parents. I wanted to sing and dance in musicals. Having been introduced to that world on a junior high school field trip to see the movie musical Oklahoma. Carlos always wanted to be an artist. Having been introduced to that world by the animated films of Walt Disney. We were not kidding. At ages 19 and 20, at the dawn of the swinging 60s, off we went to New York City. Two Chicanitos from East LA, who knew no one there, nor anyone who'd ever been there. Okay, we had just seen breakfast at Tiffany's. <laughs> we arrived in Manhattan wide-eyed, like Dorothy stepping into Oz. Every day was an adventure. It wasn't just a new city, it was a new world, a million miles from home. In LA, being of Mexican descent, that's what we were in those days, was for me feeling less than, not as good as. Being of Mexican descent in New York City, it was exotic. <laughs> no, I was friggin' Frida Kahlo. <laughs> Without the trenzas. <laughs> Carlos stayed three months, as planned, before going back to art school in LA, and I stayed 20 years. 20 years away from family, my culture. There was one Mexican restaurant in all of Manhattan when we got there, one. And in all the years I stayed, closest I ever got to anything Latino at all was sitting next to a Puerto Rican on the subway. And gay life, I did mention I'm gay from birth, right? <laughs> Gay life, even this most cosmopolitan of cities, was still very much underground, as was I. It was 1962. But it was still liberating. I felt free, not just to be gay, but to be whoever I was, and to become whoever I wanted to be. And far from any possible family confession, the phrase coming out did not yet exist. I never really did come out. I more or less oozed out. <laughs> the swinging 60s with its flower power, free love, and Woodstock didn't just swing. It was a decade of counterculture and revolution. Vietnam, black power, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the early Chicano movement, Stonewall, assassinations. I'm busy trying to break into showbiz. <coughs> Woodstock, for me, was just getting stuck in festival traffic, driving back from summer stock up in the Catskills. My rave reviews from Bye Bye Birdie clutched in my hot little hand. The Stonewall Riots, considered the kickoff event of the gay liberation movement, only meant the subway stop in the village was a madhouse while I was busy trying to get to rehearsal for an off-Broadway rock musical. The Cuban Missile Crisis, that was intense. A missile could reach Manhattan. 
my new home. The assassinations left me numb as I watched the news break one after another on my small black and white TV screen. Everything else, just headlines and images on the news happening somewhere else, had nothing to do with me. I had total tunnel vision. All I could think of was a stage and a spotlight, nothing else. This is the embarrassing part I was talking about. The tumultuous 60s gave way to the disco 70s. I hazily recall late nights into early mornings at Studio 54. I think that was me. But it wasn't all mere disco balls and happy time drugs. The 70s brought Nixon, Watergate, Roe versus Wade, Kent State, Harvey Milk, and Cesar Chavez. And in the cusp of the 60s surrendering to the 70s, I see an <coughs> off-Broadway play with a full cast of gay characters. It's 1968, a year before Stonewall. The Boys in the Band is the first mainstream play ever to depict this taboo, unspoken world for all to see. I'm not at all comfortable sitting in the theater that long ago night. Art can be confrontational. It's not a pretty picture of us up there on that stage, but it does remain a landmark moment in gay history. And in the first year of the new decade, the first ever gay pride march takes to the streets in Greenwich Village. The Christopher Street Gay Liberation Parade attracts a good-sized crowd, but I'm not there. I'm not ready to come out. I'm not closeted. All my friends and colleagues know I'm gay. I am a musical theater. <laughs> but I have no desire to be part of a pack to advertise. It's a private matter for me. Straight America starts to peak at gay America, and I'm watching it all unfold from a distance. Same year, same year, 1970, on the other side of my world in East LA where Carlos and I grow up, the Chicano moratorium explodes. 20 to 30,000 march in what begins as a nonviolent protest against the disproportionate number of Latino dead in Vietnam and for social justice here at home. It erupts into a police riot with an activist Chicano journalist killed. A tear gas canister is shot into the Silver Dollar Cafe by an officer of the law, accidentally striking Ruben Salazar did. The Chicano and gay communities come out of the closet at the same time. And just two years later, in Delano, California, a small organization co-founded by Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta in the early 60s joins the AFL-CIO as the United Farm Workers Union with Chavez as their leader. And Carlos writes me about leaving art school to support Caesar and the UFW with their mission, to better the lives of the campesinos that work in the fields under brutal conditions. His chapter on activism begins. Carlos paints murals and banners for the UFW and posters and sets for the Teatro Campesino, the cultural arm of the fledgling army, a union. Well, they were, they were an army, kind of. <laughs> Luis Valdez uses his art for social justice and creates the acting troupe that does plays in the fields to rally the workers to join the new union. They tour nationally and internationally in support of their cause. The teatro remains active to this day, and Luis Valdez is recognized as the premier Chicano playwright and founder of the modern Chicano theater. Dad had an early friendship with Cesar Chavez back in the 50s, when Dad traveled with his band in the Central Valley and Caesar went to his dances. Dad uses his art, his music, to help his friend. He writes and records El Corrido de Deleno about Caesar and the UFW. It brings the plight of the campesino and the work of the new union to the airways for the first time, giving a voice to the campesino. The Corrido becomes an anthem for the UFW during those early dark days of the union and is sung by farm workers to this day. Dad and Carlos are in the thick of the Chicano movement. I'm going to opening nights of Broadway musicals. I've started a new life chapter in New York 
Rolls are scarce for a Chicano in those days, so quite by accident, too long to go into here, I start working for a Broadway talent agent. I like it. So, for the next dozen years, I find myself representing Tony Award winners and future Hollywood stars in the years from A Chorus Line to Cats. I remain friends with many former clients, including a skinny 11-year-old girl who grew up to do quite well in the business. I'm happy to say that Sarah Jessica is the same sweet little girl that sat at my desk reading Variety, except really, really rich. <laughs> One opening night changed during my agent years changes everything for me. A small hit play from LA comes to my hood, Broadway, as a big, fat play at the Winter Garden Theater. Reese Valdez arrives with Zoot Suit, the first and to date only Chicano play to hit the great white way. Luis brings a gaggle of Chicanos to Broadway, including Dad. Zoot Suit features several Pachuco songs that Dad wrote and recorded back in the 1940s Zoot Suit era. Vamos a bailar, Los Chucos Suaves, Marijuana Booty. <laughs> in true theater tradition, the opening night party at Sardi's is at Sardi's. Now, I've spent many an opening night there, the room filled with famous Broadway faces. But this night, East meets West. My worlds collide. Dad is there, and Tony Plana, Ros Portillo, Edward James Olmos, Lupe Ortiveros. Chicanos, and Dad's music on Broadway for me is confusing. <laughs> Surreal. <laughs> but I'm also proud. Proud of Dad. Proud of mi gente. Proud to see an entire stage of brown faces. And later that same year, 1979, the first National March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights takes place on my birthday, October 14th. It serves to nationalize the gay movement and is the first such march on our nation's capital, drawing over 100,000 supporters. I'm not one of them. I'm in Paris celebrating my birthday and seeing clients in the French version of the musical Ain't Misbehaving. New decade, new chapter. I've been going back and forth to LA from New York all through the years, usually at holiday time, and of course I always spend time with Carlos. During the 1980 annual visit, he introduces me to Chicano activists, mostly writers, actors, and visual artists. We go back and forth, English, Spanish is familiar, comfortable. A feeling of belonging washes over me. I think you might recognize that on the far right, that five-year-old girl is Barbara Carrasco. <laughs> John Baladez, that's me in a body wave. Um, Judy, Judith Anderson, uh, Judith Anderson, <laughs> Judith Hernandez, who else? Carlos. Uh, Luis Valdez's uh, sister, Socorro, and Cindy. The guy in the glasses, we can't figure out who that is. Did anybody recognize him? <laughs> Honestly, Barbara. Well, the way that's me. Huh? That's John Valdez. <coughs> Not John. John. We know John. This guy. <laughs> well, you're useless to me. <laughs> I know John. Anyway, but that's quite a group. That's quite a group. They all went on to do good things, didn't they? Um, I listen, I listen, and I hear what the group is saying, and it's a rude awakening for me that so little has changed for Latinos, Chicanos, with all that has happened in this last decade. Something important is brewing, and I want to get involved. New York pulls me back. I'm not ready. Zoot Suit eventually becomes the closer. I keep thinking about how I felt that opening night, surrounded by all the Chicanada. And after another trip to LA and hanging out with Carlos and others out to make a difference, I'm ready. I moved back to LA after 20 years and jumped into the Latino community with a vengeance. I start casting for stage and television and I bring in Latino actors when no one asked for them. They barely asked today and this was the early 80s. I write for Hollywood trade papers and magazines, and I always feature Latinos. 
I interviewed the big names like Montalban and Rita Moreno, and newcomers like a pubescent Mario Lopez, and a just arrived actor here for a new TV series that makes Jimmy Smith a star. I join Latino groups working to improve our image in the media and produce fundraisers for Latino arts organizations. I sit on the board of a Latino theater company. My New York friends label me a born again Hispanic. <laughs> My LA friends label me an activist. I'm not comfortable accepting the new role. So many have worked for years organizing rallies, walking along picket lines, handing out leaflets door to door. I'm the new kid on the block, sitting on a panel in an air-conditioned hotel ballroom, putting on a black tie fundraising event, or interviewing a celebrity. I feel a faux Chicano. Others are more Chicano than me. Am I less? The 80s for me is a decade of defining my new identity. But while I'm struggling with being a born-again Chicano, not Hispanic, my gay community comes under attack. It starts quietly, without a name, about the time I make the move home. It ravages a generation so rapidly it's hard to keep up with the staggering losses. The arts community is particularly hard hit by the AIDS crisis. This colleague, that coworker, a mentor, a lover, a best friend. I lose Carlos and many, many more. The plague creates a backlash against the gay community that is swift and fierce. The community unites, mobilizes, and fights back. And very much motivated by the AIDS crisis and the Reagan administration's shameful lack of action, the second National March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights hits our capital in 1987. Close to half a million joined the march, and among those who carry the lead banner and speak that day, Cesar Chavez. Cesar believed he could not stand up for one oppressed, marginalized group, and not another. And maybe he was returning a favor. Gay men and lesbian women marched right alongside Caesar and Dolores Huerta in those early and most dangerous days of the UFW. I don't get back to DC for the second national march. I'm starting a new career in midlife and finding my way to use it to improve our Latino presence in Hollywood. We all know film and television sends images all over the world. And like so many of us, I'm pissed off and tired of our images being limited and too often negative. At that time of my life, being Chicano is in first position, and I'm gay on the side. Mm -hmm. Using my talents and more than a dash of chutzpah, in a few years I'm producing for television. New chapter, the 90s and beyond. I produce a lot of network and cable television specials, award shows, a couple of talk shows, lots of music specials for PBS, like the Concert of the Americas that I co-produced with Quincy Jones for the Clinton White House. I also produce and stage live international arts and culture events everywhere, from the Kennedy Center in Washington to the Music Center right here for the LA Opera. I pretty much stick to Latino-themed productions, most often Mexican and Mexican-American. I use my art to celebrate my culture, to educate illuminate, to make a statement. I meet many of my Latino Chicano heroes through my producing career, especially during the years I produced El Show de Paul Rodriguez on Univision. Paul hosted this weekly talk variety program that brought the biggest US and Latin American stars together in a bilingual format, groundbreaking for its time. This is the early 90s, my very first producing gig. Jack Lemmon, Celia Cruz, Little Richard, Vicente Fernandez, Linda Ronstadt, they all stop by. And I meet a very special guest for me, Cesar Chavez. I finally get involved with the UFW, long after Dad and Carlos. We get to things when we get to things, that is, when we're ready. I help 
with UFW fundraising events, I called friends and I booked Caesar on other TV talk shows at his request. And with my friend, filmmaker Jesus Trevino, we put on an event at the Directors Guild of America to introduce Caesar to Hollywood, hoping the industry will join in support of his message. Yeah, it was a good day. Just two years later, I get a call to organize and bring Latino Hollywood up to Delano for Caesar's funeral after his unexpected and sudden death. I know Caesar a short time, really, just the last few years of his life. Our conversation's always about the campesinos. And I so regret we never once spoke about LGBTQ issues, especially within our Latino Chicano community. I never knew he was a strong ally for us until after he was gone. I'm watching television a few years ago and I start to see gay characters on so many programs, especially sitcoms. Great, but where are the Latinos? Could I ever have imagined I would see gays on television before Latinos? Honestly, and I started to look at my two worlds and I found strong connections, similarities. And one day, a word hit me, gay Tino. I thought it was damn clever. <laughs> I trademarked it. <laughs> and then what would I do with it? New millennium, new chapter, back on the boards. I write a solo show. Never mind, I've never written a play. Never mind, I've not been on stage in 35 years. Never mind, I was about 65. I wanted people to know Chicano and gay history. I wanted to celebrate Dad and Carlos. I wanted their legacy to live on. I wanted to use my art to entertain, educate, illuminate, make a statement. I performed gay Tino all over the country in big fancy venues like the Kennedy Center, lots and lots of universities, good number of rat holes. I'll go anywhere to get my message out. And because of Gay Tino, I find myself adding gay activists to my life as I make speeches and do TV and print interviews on the subject, sometimes in Espanol Pocho. <laughs> Did you know that gay in Spanish is gay? <laughs> my two causes, as it turns out, work very well together. This doesn't mean I'm gay with a side of Chicano. I still do my Chicano thing, like marching in my birthplace of Tucson with Linda Ronstadt and Dolores Huerta <laughs> after SB 1070 reared its ugly head. Both ladies, like many of us, strong advocates in both the Chicano and gay communities. I started my talk today telling you that I'm still looking forward to that next chapter that next page. At this age and stage of my life, stop doing the math, I just turned 74. <laughs> At this stage and shocking age, I've started another new chapter. I'm a strong believer in reinventing and challenging oneself always. My new chapter could be titled El Profe, as I find myself in the world of a couple of years ago, the UCLA Cesar E. Chavez Chicano Chicana Studies Department invited me to teach as a distinguished community scholar. UCLA invites folks from outside the traditional boundaries of the academic world who can contribute to their instructional program through life experience. That's me all over. I have no teaching credentials. Two years at East LA College with an AA. <laughs> They asked I create a course based on my solo show. Gay Tino, performance, and the power of one must have worked because I was back again just this past quarter with the same course, this time as a guest lecturer. And I'm hugely honored and completely flabbergasted to have recently been appointed a Regents lecturer jointly through the UCLA Chicano Studies and LGBT departments, and that is a gay Tino. <laughs> I, uh, I've celebrated activism in the arts today because that's been my world, my journey, Chicano and gay, my causes. 
But activism in support of a cause can take many roads, many styles, shapes, and sizes, and colors. It takes all kinds, and every one is valid, each important, whatever the cause or the tools. The arts may be more visible, more high profile, sometimes add a bit of glam, and I salute the many that do it more quietly, with no stage, no spotlight, no podium. They work in a cubicle, or they sit in a basement. They march, go door to door, make phone calls or stuff envelopes for their cause. They are to be counted, and they are my personal heroes. But whatever your road, your journey, your cause, whatever your tools, however you do it, whenever it comes, take it, grab it, run with it. More than ever, our voices must be heard, so embrace your journey. Keep writing new chapters always. I te watch carnales. Thank you. <laughs> um, we can do a little quick Q and A if anybody has any questions, or do you already know too much about? <laughs> Not a single question. Whoa, uh, Armando, what do you eat? <laughs> what do I eat? You're 74 or? Yeah. Great. Isn't that so? Imagine had I take care of myself, how good I look. <laughs> and these are all my teeth, too. I don't know. It's just in the genes. Good good peasant stock, right? Good, good Indian stock. Yes, ma'am. Um, how'd you get the Bye Bye Birdie part? <laughs> I auditioned. In fact, I did book Birdie uh, like three or four times. And it was funny because we're talking the early 60s. And I remember one review that said, because I guess Guerrero, they put two and two together even then. And they said, and the Latin cast whose features worked perfectly for this character. And I thought, first time they ever, because usually they thought I was Italian. <laughs> or, or I'd audition and they'd say, oh, thank you very much, but you're too Mediterranean. <laughs> went, okay, well, that's better than being a Chicano. No, but really, they, they didn't know what I was, you know. I mean, really, there was, now there's, of course, not only a million Mexican restaurants, but Mexicans. The first of the, the Puerto Rican, you know, Cubanos, mostly to Miami, but there. But now there's a huge influx of, of Mexicans uh, in, in New York. Uh, but no, when I was there, we were like, what are you? Can, can I ask, just what did you sing to audition? Your oh my audition? God, do I remember? I had a couple of uh, songs I would do. I don't remember that early what I would have sung. I might have sung uh, uh, from the show, from oh, really? the show. There I go. Just like some kissing, and I mean, to kiss me a few. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't remember, but, but uh, it was fun. That road was really fun. And I'm sorry, embarrassed to say not that, but I still have that Bye Bye Birdie Cops too, just because I, I liked it. Yes, I couldn't get into it, but I liked it. <laughs> I had a question. What about your mom? What kind of influence? She was fabulous. Thank you for asking about her, because, you know, people think Dad had me all by himself, you know? Uh, it was really my mom, and in fact, it was my mom who was a smart businesswoman. We're gonna build apartments, we don't wanna be a burden to you kids once you grow up and gone. It was my mother. Nightclub, dad opens it, his name, he'd go in and sing and go home. My mother ran it, hired, fired. It was my mother who didn't even have a high school education. She was a smart, smart, she was a very street smart lady. And she ran the house. Dad would come home with his guitar, He'd take money out of his pocket and he'd throw it on top of the dresser and he'd go to bed and then she'd pay the bills and she'd shop and she had no budget. She, he didn't know, he didn't care. He just wanted, you know, he knew she'd take care of everything and she did, you know, so. He was strictly an artist, meaning that's all they know how to do. I've met many people since that are like that. Really, they, they just know their art. Look at Barbara Carrasco, that she can dress herself shops. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I love Barbara so much, and she's so easy to tease. Look at how red she gets. <laughs> I, I, oh, well, let me finish. Excuse me, what about my mom? My mom, um, uh, even in, in, in Gaitino, she's very much, she's there, but nothing compared to his dad and Carlos, you know. My mother had a uh, Mexican-born mother and a first-generation Irish-American father. And there was a scandal when dad wanted to marry, as I say in Gatino, a half-breed. You know, they were pissed that he was uh, marrying somebody who wasn't, you know, all, all Mexicana. So 
but she was a very, very strong lady and uh, very street smart. She was as big a personality as dad. She was just huge, which is why I moved to New York. I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to grow up in this town. <laughs> Not with those two. You know, they were just too strong. So I had to go off and find my own way. But she was great. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I, I wanted to see if you had a perspective on the especially musical culture of Tucson. My family, my mother's side. Oh, it's very, very rich. In fact, at, at, funny you should say that. Dad used to always say, you know, I'd like to uh, I'd like to buy a little casita in the barrio in Tucson one day and turn it into a little museum for all the Mexican and Mexican American musicians. He said, people always know Linda, Ron's dad, and they know me, Lalo, but you know, there were so many and trios and mariachis and he wanted, so I just, I was in Tucson a couple of weeks ago and uh, I found out there's this wonderful uh, house, one of the few that exist of some stature. I mean, there's some houses still from the Radio days, but this is like Hacienda time with the back and it's beautiful. And it's, it's owned by the Arizona Historical Society. And it's been closed for a few years. And I just talked to them about reopening it and using a good part of it to honor all the Tucson musicians because it's a very rich heritage here. The entire mariachi movement started in Tucson, you know, with the Changuitos Feos. I just, Dad's last ever concert was in Tucson, as it should be, his last public performance. And it was at the Changuito Feo's 40th anniversary. They have spawned the mariachi cobre and great mariachis and they teach kids. And, I, and about three months ago I was there and I sang Dad's Barrio Viejo with the cobre at the 50th anniversary of the cobre. It's a very rich musical history in Tucson, very much so. Uh, Linda Ronstadt's great grandfather had a symphony orchestra back in the turn of the century in Tucson. Well, my grandfather was part of it. Maybe well, give me a snapshot. We'll hang it on the wall. Oh, yeah. All right. No, well, we're going to do research and find all that stuff. Hi. Uh, you mentioned Jesus Salvador Trevino and, it, and your, the title of your talks. So I want to ask you about uh, Latino media advocacy and Latino media activism. Uh, I, I like your talk and your whole life story because it's more in the mainstream. But, you know, uh, like John Noriega's first book, it's like Chicano cinema is community organized, community. See, you know, you're already making me less a Chicano. Well, but I'm yeah, that's, that sounded that I'm a less a Chicano. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. I'm interested in Chicanos in the mainstream too, but it doesn't seem as political. Ma, as see, so you're, and it sounds to me like it's not as Chicano. Well, so can you speak to that? I will. Okay. Jesus Trevino is my idol, because Jesus was in the, you know, in the trenches of Montezuma Esparza and uh, who else in the back? And that, that any footage exists from the moratorium and all that was because people like Jesus Trevino was there. He's got a marvelous book. Did you guys publish it? It's called uh, Eyewitness to History. It's terrific. It's great because he really was there. And, and he, like Monte, they did eventually work through all that, were there, did it, and did their huge con. And then they worked mainstream for years. Jesus Trevino for years did mainstream television. Monte does Latino films and non-Latino films. So yeah, they, but the, the thing about mainstream is that that's how you get the message out. Because otherwise you wind up preaching to the choir. That's part of the thing that I even deal with in terms of Chicano theater, you know, because I don't consider Gaytino Chicano theater. I don't. And the sad thing is that for most Chicano theater, the only people going to see it are Chicanos. And I purposely designed my show to be more mainstream because I wanted other people to know our history. So that was my choice. And I lived in mainstream for years. I'm one of those rare people that crossed over from the mainstream. I was already there. I didn't have to cross over into it. I was. And I chose to cross back into it because what I learned there served me very well for many years, because when I was doing that in the 80s, nobody was. Nobody was. Oh, just picking your nose, sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> hi. Hi, I'm fascinated by the- And I have just got passionate, I'm not angry, I'm passionate. Well, when people criticize Luis Valdez, Moctezuma Esparza, Gregory Nava for making these assimilationist crossovers. Of course, so. totally. So we're not negating that, nobody's negating that. This is my story today. <laughs> so, um, Let them write an activism in the art speech. Yeah. I'm fascinated by that um, 
which you talked about with the opening night party at Sardi's uh -huh. for Zoot Suit, uh -huh. which um, I, remember, I remember going to, to, uh, to Sardi's in 1979, December of 1979, and it was white. I mean, of Walter course. Kerr was there, of course, you know, having dinner. So I'm just wondering, who was there? Was it, was there was this kind of like um, coming together of that Broadway community and no, Chicanos at all? No, of course not, of course not. All the Chicano, that was, so this part of Sardi's. Were Puerto Ricans there? Was Tita Rivera there? Cheetah, Cheetah's barely Puerto Rican. I'm really, and I adore her, and, and we go way back. But uh, she's she's completely got my She just is, and that's fine. That's her choice, you know. But um, no, it was completely separate. You know, that's the thing you're talking about. You know, a uh, multicultural, but it, we we still just stick with our own. Years ago, I did a series of specials for uh, television with Paul Rodriguez, and the first one we did in San Quentin. And then we realized that most were in prison because they had been in gangs. So we did a second one about gangs. And then we found, found that most are in gangs because they had dropped out of school. So the third one we did about what it's like to get an education, and we picked four schools. We went to Garfield, where I went, which is now 99.9% .9 Latino. We picked a, uh, a, a school in South Central, which was 99% percent uh, african-american we picked a very wealthy white private school oakwood and then we went to santa monica high because it's very mixed you get the wealthy white kids from malibu you get the chicanada and latinos from the barrio you get everything but you know what it wasn't mixed at all all the african-american kids sat there and all the latinos sat there and all the white kids sat there it's just i don't know Birds of a feather, I guess. I don't know, but that—that is—that's that's why I say about Chicano theater, you know, that wonderful uh, encuentro going on at Los Angeles Theater Center right now. They brought in 17 uh, theater companies from all over the country, Latino, with 117 Latino artists. I will guarantee you, 90% of the people that come there will be Latino Chicano. And you would think theater lovers who love theater want to see, hey, what is Chinese theater like? What is that? You know, but. Sadly, I that's my that's what I feel, you know. Scratching your nose or raising your hand? Oh. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I, I just I just wanted to uh, we were just at, at Encuentro uh, a couple nights ago and it's in fact just just like you say. And, yeah. it's, and it's very unfortunate because a lot of the stories, uh, one in particular I think his journey uh, oh, yeah. just deals with something, you know, uh, a very big deal right now and, and it was, you know, just, you know, the, the high school kids from, from I went to the park and a couple of Latin Americans, that was it. it was, yeah. you know. And the thing is, all those stories are, 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 are uh, um, universal, because everybody's story is the same. Everybody wants the same damn thing, regardless of color or whatever. Everybody wants the same thing. So it, it's, I don't know, it, it's, it's, a, it's challenging, and I don't know what we've quite figured out yet how. I, I guess that's it. So we should wrap, and thank you very, very much. And uh, is there something to drink? Yes, yes, yes. All right. <laughs> Um, so, thank you for being here, and we welcome you. Please invite you to join us for a reception on our patio, um, catered by Casablanca. Some delicious oh, food. Let's um, go, and it's free. Which yeah. one are we using? Yeah.